The Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 21, is where we resume today's study. Luke 10, 21. Get your Bible, if it is possible, so that you can read the Bible with me, because we understand that the Word of God is far and away the most important thing. It's your most valuable possession, so it's good to read it along with me. Again, Luke 10, 21, in just a minute. Do want to remind you that the Scripture Verse-by-Verse -verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. There you can study all of the Bible with me four times, all the way through, in-depth, Bible study, verse-by-verse. -verse. Going back over 35 years, it's all there. You choose which series. Choose which chapter, which book, which section. <clears throat> Click and listen. That's all you got to do. And all you need to bring is your Bible to the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Okay. Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 10, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. <clears throat> Some people are too smart for their own good. Some people think they even know better than God's word. Sophisticated intellectuals crossing their legs, drinking their $10 cup of coffee, thinking they are just so smart, snickering at the word of God, snickering at the idea that Jesus is the only way to be saved or that they are somehow so bad that they need a savior. Whoa, they got a billion dollars in the bank. They can't be too bad. So they snicker and they scoff and they think they're so smart. They're too smart for their own good. They think they know better than God's word. And you are sure to be damned if you carry that attitude with you until you're dead. But that's how they are. If something in the Bible doesn't make sense to them, they either rationalize it away or they twist it to fit their own thinking rather than simply accepting it as true. Intelligence is a gift from God. And like any other gift, it is a blessing. But only if it is under the lordship of Jesus Christ and submitted to to the authority of God's word. Some people are very, very intelligent. Lots of natural ability. Lots of, lots of intelligence. The problem is they're not submitted to the lordship of Christ. So they waste that intelligence on stupid things that ruin their lives and the lives of their family members too. And they're miserable. And many of them kill themselves because their lives are so empty. They are squandering the gift of intelligence that God gives them. But that it is a gift like any other gift. And if it's not submitted to the lordship of the word of God in Jesus Christ, it's going to be more destructive than anything. On the other hand, if you have an intelligent Christian who are truly submitted to God, and governed by the word of God, they can serve the Lord in wonderful ways. Like any other gift. But intelligence is a problem when, when people trust in it more than they do in scripture. Accepting the plain truth of God's word, that's the important thing. Accepting the parts that we cannot understand is also important. 
And Jesus here expresses joy. He is blessed that God reveals truth to those who simply accept his word. We don't have to figure something out before we can believe that it is true, right? We do that all the time. We don't have to figure something out before we can believe that it's true or be blessed by it. I don't understand all the physics behind gravity, but I sure believe in it. And I'm, I'm glad we have it. I'm glad I don't go floating off into outer space. I will gladly, gladly make use of gravity, even though I, under, I don't understand it. I'm not sure anybody does. And it's the same thing with us and God and the Word of God. We may not be able to comprehend everything that God says, but we can accept it as truth because our Father has said it. And that is the way God wants us to believe him. Accept it, believe it, because God has said it. That's good enough reason right there. Maybe someday you'll be able to figure it out. Maybe someday God will explain it to you, but it doesn't matter. It's true, and that's the only thing that matters. Accept it because the word of God is true. 22. Jesus said, All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. Jesus reveals the truth about God to Christians. Jesus reveals truth about the Father to Christians. Jesus teaches Christians about Almighty God that no one else knows, and consequently we are able to learn things about our Creator that no one else knows because we Christians have Jesus and the Spirit of Jesus living inside of us and the Word of Almighty God before us. And that is a dynamite combination. And the closer we are to Christ, the better that we understand the Father because the smoother the communication is between him and us. 23, and he turned unto his disciples and said privately, blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. Do you know, <clears throat> and this is, Impossible to argue with, in my opinion. Did you know that the disciples are the 12 most privileged men to have ever lived on planet Earth? No question about it, because they knew the Son of God personally, and they lived with him for over three years in person. They were eyewitnesses to all of his tremendous miracles. They saw him calm the raging storm. They saw him walk on water in the midst of one of those storms. They, they saw him countless times healing the sick, giving sight to blind, healing paralytics, curing the incurable disease of leprosy, raising people from the dead, multiplying bread and fish to feed thousands, from a little boy's lunch. You know, Jesus did so many miracles that they lost count. But they experienced them all. Too bad they didn't have computers back in those days. They could have, you know, put all that data into a computer. We'd have a record of all the miracles that Jesus did. As it is, they just lost count. There's not enough paper in the world, John said to write them all down. And here, Jesus just wants his 12 to step back and think about just how blessed they have been and are. It's good to step back. All of us, it's good to step back and look at all the good things that God has done for us. In fact, one of the best spiritual exercises we can do is count our blessings. 24. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, 
and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And that is so true. God's people in Old Testament days understood from the Bible that he would eventually send a Savior. Consequently, generation after generation waited and hoped. But generation after generation eventually died without ever seeing those promises come to pass in their lifetime. And the disciples, they were blessed because they were alive to see it. And they were his eyewitnesses. He chose them. Jesus is reminding them of how blessed they have been. It is good for us to focus on the good that we have rather than the things that we wish we had. If we spend too much time thinking about the things we would like to have, we squander the good times we could be having with the things that God has given us. 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> the premise of this man's question is completely wrong. His question revealed a problem in his thinking and in his theology. And that's the first thing that needs to be corrected. See, he believed that a person could get right with God by being good enough. He was wondering how good he had to be, how many good things he had to do in order to be right with God. That was his question, his specific question. So look at 26. Jesus gives him a specific answer to that specific question. He said to him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? The man's question was, what good things must I do to inherit eternal life? Our Lord's initial answer is, what does the law of God say? In other words, what does the Bible say? If there's a question about right and wrong behavior or how to get to heaven, the answer is found in Scripture and nowhere else. 27, and he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength, with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. And the man did answer correctly as we will see in the next verse. If he is going to work his way to heaven, as he wants to, if he is going to be good enough to work his way into a right standing with God, then he must give God his absolute, total, undivided obedience at all times without failing, not even one single time in his whole entire life. Not only that, he must be devoted to the welfare of others as much as he is devoted to his own welfare 100% of the time, having never failed his entire life. You got the right answer, mister. You want to be good enough with God? You got to do those two things. That's absolutely right. That's how you get right with God. By your own works. You serve God perfectly all the time without ever committing one single sin, without ever making one single mistake, not even a little one, and you always love your fellow man as much as, as, much as you love yourself without failing in that even one single time too. That's how you earn your way to heaven. If you do those two things to absolute perfection from the day that you are born until the day that you die, you will certainly earn a place in heaven. There you have it. 28, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. So the man specifically asked what he had to do, right, to inherit eternal life. Jesus answered that specific question. If you want to go that route, if you want to do something to earn eternal life, if you want to be good enough, then you must keep God's law absolutely to perfection. Always, all the time, with never failing. That's the answer to his question. 
Now, do you still want to earn eternal life? Or do you still think you have what it takes? To all of you who are, you call yourself Christians, but you, you, you mix in a bunch of law and you say, well, you got to keep the law to be saved too. You got to be, you got to be, uh, you got to observe the Sabbath to be saved. You got to, you got to observe the religious feast to be saved. You got to reserve, you got to reserve, um, you got to observe the dietary laws to be saved. You got to do this law, that law, the other law to be saved along with Jesus Christ. You are going to burn in hell because the Bible specifically says about people like that in the book of Galatians, if that's your attitude, Christ will do you absolutely no good at all because you think that you're contributing to your salvation by your own works, and you can't. Good works are most definitely the result of salvation by faith in Christ, but they are not a prerequisite, and they're not, it's not a cooperative program. That is completely denied by Scripture. So look at 29. But he, desiring to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? See, he, he wants to narrow the definition of neighbor. So maybe, maybe he just did squeeze by and keep these commandments and is good enough to go to heaven. He's trying to water down the answer that Jesus gave. gave. I don't think he liked our Lord's answer because it was pretty strict, pretty narrow. Being absolutely perfect at all times, that's, very, that's a very narrow road to walk. He didn't like our Lord's answer because he knew he could not do that answer. See? Consequently, he wants Jesus to give him a little bit of wiggle room. He wants Jesus to give him a more narrow definition of the word neighbor so he can say, oh yeah, I love my neighbor as myself. And even that he wouldn't do. But he thinks he might be able to pull it off if he can get Jesus to give a narrow definition of what a neighbor is. Well, next time we will see Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan and defines what the word neighbor means. Don't miss next time, okay? Join me next time right here. We'll pick it up in verse 30. In the meantime, remember, you can study the whole Bible with me anytime you want to at the Scripture Verse by Verse website found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry and stand shoulder to shoulder with me and help me get out God's Word, you can do that by praying for me and praying for God's Word. And also when you take a break from studying at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, and prayerfully give us a Lord May Lead. Thank you for spending this time with me. I appreciate you studying the Word of God with me. And I'll see you next time, okay? Right here on Scripture Verse by Verse. Until then, so long, everyone.